Welcome to the Wealth Stream Podcast. The team at Hightower Great Lakes share their insights and passions for empowering their clients to live their best life. In this energetic podcast, we will take you on a journey to help you navigate your financial future, overcome life's challenges to reach your financial goals, and find the financial clarity you've been searching for. Let's explore the downstream impact of your wealth and what it means to you, your family, and your community to live greater. Hello and welcome to the Wealth Stream with Tim Scannell from Hightower Great Lakes. I'm really excited today. Tim has a guest in studio, and that is Stuart McMillan. Good morning, Tim. How are you? I'm good, doing well, Eric. How about yourself? Doing fantastic. You know, I Excellent. live in Nebraska, and it's beautiful here. From what, I, <laughs> it's from what I've heard, Nebraska, as I always I've, say, I've heard that. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard that from Tim a lot. <laughs> I think you're trying to convince me, but you know, it it does have its good qualities and. There's a couple of them. Anyway, exactly. enough about Nebraska. Tim, you brought Stuart on the show today. Stuart, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I am great. I am so pleased I am to meet you. not in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're starting with painful things already. Ping. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Stuart, thanks for being on the show. We'll talk to you later. All right. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Tim, why did you bring Stuart on the show besides to make fun of me? Um, I brought Stuart on because, you know, most of the podcasts in the past have talked a lot about our the wealth management process we have for entrepreneurs. And really, uh, the reason why I do this is I think entrepreneurs, I believe there are heroes. And especially now as we're going through the mm -hmm. COVID crisis and events and trying to get the country back working, I think it'll be entrepreneurs who will lead the way. So I just wanted to recognize a great story that Stuart has. And I thought we'd come up with like a two-part podcast where we talk about um, all the things he's done because it's very impressive. So that's why right. I am on him. And I believe everyone will love it. Well, I'm here to be entertained and, and he's already funny. So let's do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I guess what I thought with Stuart, I would just say, you know, just tell me a little bit about yourself as of like right now. Uh, right now I'm semi-retired from the uh, business that uh, my father started in 1971, we were officially incorporated. He was a fire chief in Gary, Indiana. And one day he solved a problem at lunch on a napkin that would correct the pressure problems that firemen had since firefighting started. And he took that idea, went to a number of manufacturers. They all told him it was either stupid or worthless, sometimes both. And uh, then one of those competitors actually took the idea and made my father just a wee bit angry. And he cooked on that for a year and one day declared that we were going to go into the business of making fire nozzles mm. against these two behemoths, uh, two companies. You know, our first year in sales, we did $7,000, a big year. And they were both companies doing $70 uh, million a year each. So the family thought he was crazy, should be committed. Um, I think that's characteristic of many entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. the family... Um, thinks they're crazy. And, and let me back you up just one second, because why the passion for fire nozzles? I mean, what's the genesis of that? Because that's unique. It is. Uh, my father started chasing fire trucks when he was still in diapers and uh, ended up marrying the fire chief's daughter and um, just always loved firefighting. He would actually ride the train from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, into Chicago and spend the weekend riding with the Chicago Fire Department. And then when he went to work, he had 13 job offers out of college. He graduated top of his class from Iowa University in uh, engineering, had 13 job offers, and took the lowest paying job offer to work for a fire truck manufacturer. Hmm. That was in Elmira, New York, where I was born, and I still hold the record for the biggest baby ever born in <laughs> Elmira, New York, 12 pounds two for all those who want to know what that number is. But... Um, my father got fired from that job for losing a check to a customer, a lunch check. His boss had told him that if he ever let a customer buy him a meal, he would fire him. And my dad was doing a service job at a small town department, and uh, the fire chief took him to lunch at a restaurant owned by his sister, mm -hmm. and he would not let my dad pay. My dad told him, well, you got to let me pay or I'll get fired. Well, the fire chief thought that was hilarious. And so at the next trade show, the fire chief came into the booth and talked to my dad's boss and said something to the effect of, oh, I hear you're going to fire Clyde for doing a good job. And when they got back from the trade show, my dad was let go oh, as wow. an example. Imagine that happening today. 
Mm-hmm. So he got cut loose, and he came to the wonderful garden city of Gary, Indiana, to work for the steel mill. Uh, that's when he first discovered that he was a salesman because he convinced my mother that Gary was a great place to live. <laughs> I'm sure back then it was a little nicer. Uh, well, you had to dust three times a week, and you still couldn't stay ahead of it because of all the sure. the pollution. It's sure. gone now. but uh, So he was in a town with no fire department that was volunteer, and so he started his own. And uh, that fire department grew and had these water issues, and that's where he solved the problem. He actually was burned in 1955 at the Standard Oil Fire in uh, East Chicago, Indiana. And he was the most seriously injured to live at that little disaster. It was the largest industrial loss in U.S. history at the time. And that burn was caused by a nozzle that didn't have the right pressure. And so that gnawed at him for years and years and years until nearly 15 years later he came up with a solution. Okay. So that was kind of the the thought behind it or that was what started it, it right. all. Okay. And and what about the napkin? You mentioned that. Well, the napkin uh, was discovered. We all thought it was folklore for many years. Uh, and then one day we had a lawsuit in California and they had a discovery request for all of my father's paperwork. And my assistant was going through a drawer, looking through for design-related information, and found a simple manila envelope with the word napkin in the corner. And so some 20 years later, it was discovered uh, after my father had passed. So I guess that's where the story picks up with me, is that uh, I was the first employee of the company, um, working my way through college. And then when I graduated college in 77, now you know how old I am, (laughs) um, Although it took me 11 years to go to college, so no. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, when I graduated, my father quit U.S. Steel, and uh, we both went full-time in the business. And then in 82, um, really the only person I ever rescued from a fire was my own father. We were fighting a fire in the basement of a house, and he collapsed. And myself and another guy dragged him out. He promptly lit up a cigarette mm. and told me it was a different kind of smoke, but it was okay. <laughs> sure. And then we carted him off to the hospital, and um, later that week he died from an angiogram. So at the age of 27, I became president of the company. We had 19 employees, and we had just done our first million dollars in sales in 1982. And I think being young was probably one of the advantages for me because I knew I didn't know anything, and so I sought out help early on. And mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the theme of really why we're talking today is that outside assistance and what, dif- what a difference it makes for people. Yeah. So going back to just the start to give people the flavor, start out of the house. I mean, where where was your first manufacturing? Where were you creating the first nozzles? We were in the basement of our house. Uh, My mother's laundry got pushed over in the corner. As we grew and the basement became too small, we were talking with some bankers in Valparaiso, Indiana, which was about 12 miles east. And uh, they wanted to come visit the business. And so my father made a big point of everything in the basement being cleaned up and we had a laundry chute Mm -hmm. and we came down the stairs with the three bankers in their suits and turned the corner and there on the floor was dirty laundry that had come down the laundry chute and my father was just mortified over that so but sitting at the kitchen table with these three bankers and uh, they wanted to know what we needed and we told them we needed help financing we needed SBA help and they put together a package that moved us to Valparaiso oh wow out of the basement into a 6,000-square-foot building. Um, We've since moved 13 times, Mm -hmm. and currently the company occupies about 250,000 square feet and employs uh, 270 people. Okay. And I know know, we talked a little bit about your passion, or his passion and your passion for uh, the fire nozzle, but um, I grew up in Chicago where I have a brother-in-law who's a fireman. I know a lot of firemen that I graduated from high school with who became firemen. I just always assumed everyone was paid. Yeah. But um, since I've met you, I've found out that really that's not the case. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, about 20% of the firemen nationwide. It varies by state, uh, but about 20% are actually what they call professional or career. Um, Every fireman wants to think of himself as a professional. So you have 80%, um, you know, millions of people that have volunteered to be firemen. And People ask, why the heck would somebody do something like that to risk their life? And uh, I just relate it to everybody likes to be involved with team sports, and they were, especially when they're young, they're involved in team sports. 
And being a fireman is the ultimate team sport. Uh, we have plays, we have equipment, uh, we have a playing field, and when we win, people uh, survive, and when we lose, people die. And so the stakes are at the highest level you can have. And I've gone back to the fire station and cried with the guys, and I've gone back to the station and high five with the guys. It's uh, I got my 50-year pin about two years ago. Back to that age thing again, because <laughs> I actually started when I was 14 years old. Okay, um, with my dad. When the he, when you have a father as a fire chief, you get by with a few things you wouldn't get by with otherwise. Mm-hmm. And it was also a different time. Well, so you personally, then prior to '82, uh, in that fire you mentioned. Um, your involvement in the business. So it sounds like you were right out of high school in it, in college. I, mean, I was actually involved in it that. before I was out of high school. Um, I was coming home and making stuff in the basement and um, doing all the prototype work. We did have production work done outside the first few years, but the prototype work, uh, that's kind of a funny story. My dad got me a $200 lathe, 1936, quite a pile if you want to describe what kind of condition it was in, but I got home from school one day, and it was we had a half day, and my buddies and I carried it downstairs, put it together, and started making little copper bullets on it. And about 2.30 in the afternoon, my dad called, thinking I was just getting home from school, and said, don't touch that lathe until I get home. It's a dangerous machine. And it's like, well, you want me to put it back in the driveway or leave it in the basement? <laughs> so uh, I've made the joke in the past that a lot of fathers give their son a Playboy, and my dad gave me a book on how to run a lathe. Ah, so, there you go. See? But that's what made you, right? Yeah. So I was, I've was i never had any formal training on anything having to do with machine tools, and that's all been uh, learned on the job. So it sounds like 1982, uh, that was a big big point, a transition point in your life. I mean, obviously, it your, was, your yeah. father passed, um, you taking over the business. You know, a lot of the listeners are entrepreneurs, business owners, family business owners. Can you talk a little bit about that, that point, you know, leading up to and then post where you kind of had to take the reins? Um, probably one of the best examples of uh, how quickly something hit me was immediately after my dad passed, my family was all about making notifications to magazines and so forth to tell the world that he had passed. And um, the lonely voice I had was that that was a very bad thing to do, um, that what he really would have wanted was the company to go on. And if we told the world that the founder had died, we likely would end up killing the company as well. And so uh, encouraged everybody to not make announcements. And we actually ended up calling the magazines um, and telling them we did not want it to be run. And we caught all of them but one. And... At the time, I felt horribly guilty about the whole thing, and then, but in retrospect, I believe it was a, one of my very first correct decisions to make. Made a lot of bad ones too, but that was one of the good ones. And and when you're transitioning to where you were taking over, you know, I know just from knowing you, you've talked a lot about YPO mentors, things like that. So, did you had you gotten involved in that at that point, or was it something you did later, or? I got involved immediately in a group in Indianapolis. It was called CEO Net. It was just a group of about six guys. And um, one of them, I uh, was telling them about the family issues that family businesses have and that I needed help. And uh, he said, well, I know where there's a guy, but you're going to have to travel. And it's like, well, okay, tell me about him. And he said, well, he's in Valparaiso. Do you know where that is? And it's like, well, yeah, I'm from Valparaiso. And he says, oh, good. Well, then you must know him. And the name of his business was Center for Life Change. And what was funny about that is I'd gone by that place for years and thought it was a menopause clinic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Never thought of it in the context of a, of a therapist being able to say life change. So I sure. went and met with this guy. And you know, getting the right fit of a therapist is very, very important. And I was fortunate that this guy was a, a bull of a guy and had no punches pulled. And... Um, I have him to thank for my family, my wife, uh, the business, a whole host of things, because he really, uh, I was on a path to destruction at that point. I cared dearly about my dad and his legacy and um, was working myself to death. Mm. And this is the guy that showed me that if I didn't learn to be a leader and work with people in general, that I would never get any farther than what I could do on my own. 
And that was a hard lesson. Can you give an example of like what, like something he told you specifically that gave you that, that helped you with that? Was there some tool, some strategy? Uh, there was a number of tools. One of them in particular um, had to do with going to bed at night and uh, thinking through your day and who you'd crossed and maybe who you were a little quick with uh, and then making a note of that and then the following day seeking that person out and apologizing and also telling them that you need their help and mm -hmm. that um, they need to uh, give feedback and that I wanted that. So, they, you know, I'm a big guy. Um, six six and and three hundred pounds. And one day I was looking out the window in my office, and I saw this monstrous guy out in the plant. And he was towering over one of our people, and I thought, "What the heck is that guy doing to him?" And so I went out on the floor to find out what was going on. And uh, <laughs> turned out the guy was three inches shorter than me, and about I had about forty pounds on him. So all of a sudden, I realized what it feels like for me to be talking to somebody close. And so that changed how I tried to compensate for not quite being so close to people and being intimidating. But um, probably the biggest thing Alan did for me was expose uh, my own bias. I mean, I grew up a kid that was um, picked on a lot. When you're a big kid in school, everybody challenges you. And so I had this very poor self-image. And so I started down a path of dating women that made me look good, you know, mm -hmm. where I could walk in the room and the guys would say, wow, how's he with her, that kind of stuff. And I'd gone through a chain of relationships where that was the only connection. And uh, it's too long of a story for a podcast. But <laughs> sure. He's the one that told me uh, that I needed to look for somebody who was an intellectual equivalent that would push back and, and be a partner with me. And I'd never seen it that way before. And Literally sitting with him, he pushed the phone across the table to me and had me call somebody that I'd left a year earlier. Hmm. Um, and that's who I've been married to for 33 years now. So ah, That's a great story. And then lessons that you translated to business and management and leadership, something you might have learned from him. So I guess that it's important for other people to see that reaching out to these groups add so much value finding mentors well it's not only that it's also the fact that they change through your life a lot of people i think stick too long with the same one and you go through phases and so that's what happened with the ceo group uh in 1990 i was invited to join ypo young presidents organization i've been in that now continuously since 1990 and that group um i absolutely am convinced i have the entire business um, because of them, they've saved me from a whole number of mistakes I would have made without their counsel. It's an incredible organization, and they have forum groups that meet monthly, and they use what they call a till of the hun confidentiality, so you can go in there. And I would say more than half of what we talk about is family-related, not business. Okay. But family certainly has a huge impact on what you're able to do in business if you don't have your family's support. So. And then, um, so how long have you been in the YPO? Since you're 1990. Still, yeah. So you're still there? I'm in OPO now, Old oh, Presidents. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I never heard of that one. Well, they throw they used to throw you out at 49, um, and they threw me out at 49, but um, my group invited me to come back, and they call it a sunset forum now where we just stay in until we're tired of each other. Our conversations have now shifted to Geritol, uh, Viagra, those kinds of things. More important as you get older in life. And, yeah. and then I guess before we get into the transition of the business itself, so mentoring. So do you feel like you have connected to mentor other people now? Are you paying back or giving, passing forward, playing it forward, however they say that? I'm certainly trying to. Um, okay. I've had several that were successful, and I've had several that weren't successful, but uh, – there's one business in particular that I'm really close to where um, the woman took over for a husband that had become incapacitated, and she's just a sponge. And uh, all I have to do is give her a little tidbit, and she takes it and runs with it and has put the company back on its feet. It's now profitable again. Uh, it's been really fun to watch her grow with that business. Yeah, one of my goals is to get you connected with more people to pass on your knowledge. I would like to do that. I mean, I, I feel like I owe a huge debt. Um I know some people that own businesses and they put the whole success on, you know, their effort. And yeah, I worked very, very hard. I worked very long hours. I loved what I did. But there is absolutely no question in my mind that uh, a great number of people along the way saved me. 
especially when it come to se- came to selling the company three years ago. Um, I have an outside board of directors that I founded in 1999, and I had one particular board member that stayed with me from 99 up into the sale of the company in 2016. And uh, I just cannot tell you how many times that guy weighed in at the proper time and made a difference. So. So what made you think about the board? Was that a recommendation? Did you just feel like you needed to reach out? Actually, we had a presentation at one of my YPO forum meetings. And this gentleman and another guy came to that meeting. They were invited to talk about having outside boards. And I was totally thrilled by the idea. YPO, you you only have, have 10 guys in the group or 12, so you have maybe an hour at most uh, of their time on a particular meeting day. And I was to the point where I felt like I needed more help than they could give me. Mm-hmm. And so when they came and made this presentation about having outside boards, um, I was really excited about it. And I called him on the way home from the meeting and asked where I would find board members. And he said, well, you can start with me. And I was shocked that he would do it. And then the other fellow that came was a World War II two-year pilot and had started like 12 businesses and was just an amazing guy. And I said, well, could any chance that Ray would join? He said, well, ask him. He said, I think he would drop a board to be on yours. And he did. Hmm. And so in just a matter of two days, I had four board members. Um, It just happened very quickly. And uh, it was just, uh, you know, a big part of it was I feel like people need to be accountable and uh, I had people working with me and for me that I felt needed to be accountable. And it was only fair that I be accountable. Mm-hmm. And then later, um, I actually gave the board control of the company. It was not an, it was an advisory board for the first uh, eight years. And then in about t- uh, 2005, I converted the board to a real outside board. And they had the right to let me go. Okay. And I made sure everybody knew that. And it was for two reasons. One is they knew that uh, they had somebody they could go to and make me accountable. And secondarily, if something happened to me, they knew that the board had authority to appoint a successor and keep the company going. I don't think enough leaders give credit to the the fact of the concerns of, uh, I hate to use the word average employee, but the average employee is very concerned about keeping their job. And they need to know that there's a successor in place and that somebody's thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And... uh, that the founder doesn't feel like for some reason he's immortal and nobody else is. Right. Now that that's super valid. So I'd wanted to do this part one of the podcast to talk about you and get some background for you. And then what I thought I'd do is in the part two, we would talk about the transition towards the sale and post sale and building your legacy after that. Okay. All right. That sounds good. So Eric, I'll tell you what, <laughs> this has been fantastic. Riveting. Uh, Stuart, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. And as far as you getting your knowledge out there, I know people that can help you get a podcast going if you like. (laughs) We'll talk about that later. But I'm I'm telling you, Tim, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for bringing them on. I am looking forward to part two. And uh, is that coming out next? Is that going to be the next one we roll out? Yeah, that'll be the next podcast right after this one. Yes. Awesome. All right. So for all you listeners, please tune in for that part two. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Wall Stream Podcast with Tim Scannell. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Tim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And you're going to want this one to show up directly because it'll be part two, the next one after this. So again, also, please share this with your family and friends. They're going to get a kick out of the story. They're going to learn a lot and they're going to hear some great information and great advice. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Hightower Great Lakes, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Stream Podcast. We hope you gained some valuable insight that you can apply to your life and share with others. Please don't forget to subscribe below to be notified when new episodes become available. And don't forget to live greater. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Hightower Great Lakes. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified 
certified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Hightower Great Lakes is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities, LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors, LLC.